everyone. Welcome to our webinar, the 2022-2023 Child Welfare Policy and Practice Update. We are thrilled to have you with us here this morning. Thank you all to those of you who signed in early. Uh, we are going to jump right in because we are chock full of information today. Uh, so some ground rules for today, let you know kind of how we're going to work through things. Um, first of all, uh, the goals for today's webinar, we want to make sure that you guys will be aware of changes to legislation and policy for things that have impacted child welfare practice here in North Carolina between July 1st of 2022 and Jul June 30th, 2023. You'll also have access to links and resources with additional information all about these law and policy changes. So as Fat Albert used to say, if you're not careful, you just might learn something before we're done. One of the best ways for you to communicate with us, many of you have already found, and that is the chat pod below the wonderful glamour shots we have of our presenters here this morning. Uh, you'll see that there are options in this chat pod. You can send a message to everyone. If you type in that chat pod under everyone, you will go ahead and send it to everyone. There is also the option if you look under participants, you can go ahead and send a private message to the hosts uh, or to someone else in the uh, room with us here. The box moves fast, uh, but do not worry. We have people monitoring throughout the day, and this will be the best way to make sure that you get your questions to us because your mics will be disabled today. So at, when you have questions, and we hope and know that you will, type them there in the chat pod for us, and we will be capturing them. Now, our presenters won't be answering those questions today, but everyone who's registered will get as a going away present a copy of the FAQ. All the questions that are asked today, they will be answered by our policy folks. And once those answers are compiled, they will be emailed out to everyone. So a holiday gift to each and every one of you who have registered. And you didn't get us anything, but we are just that kind to y'all. So as I've mentioned, there will be that follow-up document. The webinar will also be recorded. We are hoping to go top 10, possibly on YouTube, but we want you to know that the recording will be available to you on ncswlearn.org or at the FCRP website, um, and you'll see that link below, fcrp.unc.edu slash webinars. Now, for those of you who are wondering about some of these links, you will have in your mailbox already emailed to you, those of you who registered, a copy of the slide deck. So you will have that to you. Yet another holiday gift from our generous presenters, um, from all of us to all of you, making it a jolly holiday season. One of the other ways you can get our attention in addition to the chat pod, which will be the best way to do that today, is you could raise your hand um, in the uh, drop down icon up next to your uh, where you see the microphone and speaker icons. You could also raise your hand. Uh, as I said, you could agree, you can disagree, you can applaud, you can laugh. Always good when people tell you um, horrible jokes like, why does the Grinch do so well with raising plants and Christmas trees? That's because the Grinch has a green thumb. Uh, but your mic will not be active this morning. Unlike some webinars or training uh, sessions, you will not be able to use your microphones uh, today. Now, allow me to uh, present our presenters. My name is Evan Friedel, and I am with the Family Children's Resource Program at the UNC School of Social Work, and I'll be your host with the most and moderator. Um, we also have fantastic technical help from our colleagues at FCRP, Philip Armfield and Rick Zeckman. Uh, both of them will be monitoring the chat box throughout the day, looking for technical issues as well as your questions. You'll see uh, their chats are in different colors, so you can go ahead and uh, pay attention to those. Uh, but I'd also like to take an opportunity to allow our presenters to introduce themselves to you. It does say on the uh, slide that we would have three presenters today. Unfortunately, 
Uh, one of our presenters, Lori Oliver, got the gift that keeps on giving, the holiday crud, and is unable to join us here this morning. We send our healing thoughts her way. But we do have with us two other wonderful presenters who will uh, be taking us through the morning, uh, both Nora Carter and Alicia Williams uh, from the Division of Social Services. So I will start and pass the mic over to Nora to invite her to introduce herself. Nora, the mic is yours. Good morning. Hey, y'all, and thanks for the good morning wishes. My name is Nora Carter, and I support State DSS as the curriculum developer, contract support, and trainer. Welcome, everyone. All right. Thank you, Nora. Welcome, welcome. We are thrilled to have you with us here. And Alicia, can you please introduce yourself to this wonderful group we've got with us? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alicia Williams, and I am one of the child welfare trainers um, in the division to, to support the staff development team. Well, we are grateful to have you both here with us this morning. Um, you guys are going to be a fount of knowledge for the uh, hordes of people we have signing up for this webinar. And again, we thank all of you for being here with us this morning. Uh, we want to uh, go ahead and jump right in. So I am going to pass the mic over to Alicia, who's going to take us through. One thing I do want to let you all know is that but Alicia and Nora will not necessarily be reading every slide. They will be giving you some time to look at some of these slides, but they will help process each, each of them. So you may not be hearing from them right on each and every slide, but they will be giving us fantastic information today. And with that, the mic is yours, Alicia. Take it away. Thank you. So this webinar is going to be broken down into sections, the first being safety and prevention legislative updates. So we'll go ahead and hop right on in. At first, we're going to briefly discuss the safe sleep policy. And so there has been a rise in the infant mortality rate as a result of the unsafe sleep practices across our state. This policy serves as a guide to assist social workers with assisting and ensuring safe sleep, also provides an understanding for practices that are followed in the home through the child's development, ranging from birth to 12 months, as well as educating families to prevent co-sleeping, as well as unsafe sleep fatalities. We also want you to note that the safe sleep policy has been added to the cross functions of the child welfare manual. So speaking of the child welfare manual, you will also find a hyperlink entitled child welfare practice resources, where you can find um, a practice guide and a tip, um, tip sheet related to safe sleep. And just as a small reminder, as you're reviewing the content, if you have any questions, please add them to our chat. Um, we'll address them in a frequently asked questions document at the conclusion of this webinar. Okay, the safe sleep policy impacts all areas of child welfare that goes from intake all the way down to permanency planning and prevention services. So we're gonna break down those areas just briefly. So with an intake, when you're taking a report that includes an infant, um, this requires it to be documented. This information is related to the infant's sleeping arrangements. It's also required at intake that we document any concerns related to substance use by the caretaker. For assessments, workers are required to document a discussion about the infant's safe sleep. So the safety assessment, or also known as the DSS um, 5231, has been updated to include any plans to address any new identified safe sleep concerns as they arise during the assessment. Within in-home services, a safe sleep plan should be included as a part of the in-home family services agreement. Looking at the impacts of permanency planning, it is critical that the foster care worker provides safe sleep education to the birth parents, kinship 
providers or caretakers and foster parents as well as adoptive parents as they as a way to ensure that these homes are adhering to the safe sleep practices. Now, where there are per, uh, prevention services um, that provide uh, services to our families, the same will apply as the child welfare agency's services. Due to the voluntary nature of this services, there are a few differences. So as mentioned before, you will be able to retrieve this information through the division's uh, website. A link has been provided on this slide as a quick reference to policy. Um, the revised changes will be located within cross functions. So for more information, you would just reach out to your regional child welfare specialist um, and include your local supportive manager. So now we're going to touch a little bit about the plan of safe care. With the plan of safe, um, excuse me, with the plan of safe care that comes into play when the agency has been identified or has identified a newborn infant that has been affected by substances. The plan of safe care should address the health and substance use disorder needs of both the infant and the affected family or caregiver. A new statewide form has been created by the division to help support the agencies in their efforts to develop a comprehensive plan of safe care with the families we serve. The development of this form is designed to capture certain information along with conversation, conversational prompts, plans, and resources necessary to address safety and well-being needs. This form provides a framework for the family's safety network within the context of substance use factors. We also want you to note that this form serves as a living document throughout the life of the case and serves as a supplement to the safety assessment. A new plan of safe care form has been posted to our division's forms page. And for more information related to the plan of safe care, you can reach out to the Human Services Program Consultant. As was said earlier, we're going to give you an opportunity to review the slides, and you'll see on each slide the reference uh, to the Deer County Director letter. The next area we will cover is the second phase of changes to the policy manual in CPS assessments and in-home services. This information was found in the DCDL or Deer County Director letter dated November 2022. As you read over this slide, please take note of any questions you may have and add them to the chat line. This slide shows additional changes to the Child Protective Services family and investigative assessments policy changes. And again, it's the second phase. As you will notice here, the verification of custody letter, which is the DSS 5760, should be provided to foster parents and others requiring notification for permanency planning policy. And of course, for more information, please contact your local regional child welfare consultant. Let's now review the updates to the intake and assessment policy manual dated May 2023.
As you review this slide, you will see terminology changes from improper discipline to unsafe discipline. Also note, DUI changes from neglect to abuse. And lastly, time frame changes for reporting. Other case reviews indicated this decision was being used incorrectly for families who needed in-home services. Also changes to reflect child protective services needed versus services needed. And other case decision title changes to include wording of child protective services. As you can see, there are several other changes here. Please reach out to us in the chat with your questions or reach out directly to the contact found here. Now we want to touch base briefly on firearm safety. As you know, firearm safety is an important component in safeguarding children. Our North Carolina statutes require all adults to keep firearms secure. When children are present, our child welfare workers are required to ensure this statute is followed for all families impacted by the child welfare system. A guidance document was developed to assist agencies on how to address firearms across the continuum of child welfare services. It does include resources for social workers as well as information specific to address intake, screening child wel welfare assessments, in-home and foster care services. There is an additional guidance which provides a comprehensive overview on how, how to address firearm safety. Now let's take a look at unsafe discipline. As you review this information, several questions may come to mind. Please make note of those for later or take time now to write them in the chat. And as we said earlier, all of this information can be found on the DCDL respective to the time period. Here are further resources that you will find useful on this topic as well. The new clinical assessment of protective parenting replaces the former child family evaluation. When there is an assessment of emotional abuse, the medical provider and the forensic interviewer work together to provide one consolidated report from both disciplines, which is supported by video of the interview. This eliminates the need for multiple child interviews. It also supports the North Carolina transformation into a trauma-informed child welfare system. This coordination will allow the local child welfare agencies to obtain needed information to support families, safety plan, 
and minimize the number of providers interviewing children suspected of being maltreated. In addition to asking questions in the chat feature, please feel free to reach out to the section chief for more information. Regional Child Abuse Medical Specialists, also known as RAMS, and Medical Evaluation Policy Updates are what we will be reviewing now. As of August 2023, this policy was included in the DCDL. As you review the slide, several questions may come to mind regarding these updates regarding RAMS. In addition, you will find other information in the Child Welfare Manual, Assessments Manual, and Child Welfare Practice Resources. For any questions that arise, please type in the chat or reach out directly to Emmy Weibel, the RAMS manager. Now we will get into some of the updates from the permanency planning section of DHHS. For young people who age out of foster care, we want to ensure that they experience optimal well-being. The information in the next few slides will help young people to do just that. Fostering Health North Carolina, a program funded by North Carolina DSS, has developed a resource document that is related to Medicaid health insurance for youth aging out of foster care, as well as young adults formerly in foster care. For more information on these resources, including possible eligibility for a free cell phone, please contact the state links coordinator also, feel free to write your questions in the chat space. North Carolina DSS provides counties with protocol and guidance to support compliance with the law and best practice of child welfare services. This protocol and guidance includes remaining in compliance with applicable federal civil rights laws. North Carolina DSS, as well as county departments of social services, are prohibited from discriminating for reasons of race, ethnicity, color, national origin, sex, including discrimination based on sexual orientation and discrimination based on gender identity, religion, age, disability, and or political beliefs. All persons who are supported through the North Carolina child welfare system have the right to their records and other personal information remaining private. Based on changes to these policies, the verification of custody letter has been changed to reflect a new version. Also, the foster child notification of placement change form and its instructions have been revised. These changes can be found on the state DSS website. There you will not only find the policy updates, but the new and revised forms as well. Once again, 
you may have questions, which we will pull from the chat and answer at a later time. When this particular DCDL was first distributed, it was during the time we recognize as Human Trafficking Month. However, we want to continue to promote awareness throughout. Due to many reasons, children and youth who are impacted by the child welfare system are at a greater risk for human trafficking. The Administration for Children and Families, also known as ACF, has recently released new resources to assist child welfare agencies and community providers in strengthening the child welfare response to human trafficking. These resources include federal resources, as well as North Carolina resources. And here you will find contact information for the foster care coordinator should you have questions. As you see here, there are quite a few references with respect to human trafficking supports and information. Also, please feel free to reach out to the contact person for more information, as well as your questions added to the chat line. North Carolina DSS worked collaboratively with the Division of Child Development and Early Education to provide updates and changes to assessing the criminal history record information or CHRI for potential adoptive parents. A recent audit conducted revealed a compliance issue with the release of CHRI where it was determined that some employees have access to the CHRI without the appropriate training. The criminal justice information system security policy have defined CHRI as information is considered CHRI if it is transferred or reproduced directly from CHRI received as a result of a national FBI check and associated with the subject of the record. This includes information such as conviction, disposition data, as well as identifiers used to index records regardless of format. Example of formal and informal products or verbalizations include correspondence such as letters and email, documents such as forms and handwritten notes, conversations either in person or by telephone, and data fields such as those stored in database tables or spreadsheets. Information is considered CHRI if it confirms the existence or non-existence of CHRI. Due to the compliance issues, all staff of every public and private child placing agency who are assessing the accessing the CHRI will be required to take the mandated training. This includes all staff providing adoption services who participate in adoption team meetings or who reviews and evaluates CHRI. To request a CHRI form, please re reach out to the contact person as well as write any questions you may have in the chat. Now let's review updates to the health care power of attorney.
to assist counties, the division to, uh, the Division of Social Services provided five wishes booklets, which include steps to complete advanced directives and identify individuals to make decisions regarding health care. Changes also include preferences on the use behalf if they are unable to make decisions on their own. As was said earlier, the division provided five wishes booklets to counties. For more information on this resource and other questions you may have, type in the chats or reach out directly to the state links coordinator. As we continue with another DCDL from last year on subsequent living arrangements. This information on subsequent living arrangements discussed quality data and accurate reporting. For more information, please reach out to these available resources. The topic of juvenile petitions is quite extensive, as you will see. This comprehensive information has been covered in a webinar which can be found on NCSW Learn. You'll see here steps for accessing the information and please remember to write any questions you may have in the chat space. There has been a significant update surrounding monthly in-person visits. The initial changes to the monthly care visits in person came out of a response to coronavirus. A declaration of a state of emergency followed for North Carolina on March 10, 2020, and a national emergency was declared on March 13, 2020. As you can see from this slide, the ACF issued a subsequent letter that allowed video conferencing to count as an in as an in-person child residence visit. Although the state of emergency order was terminated, the video conferencing flexibility remained in place until June 2020. As of June 2023 of this year, all caseworker visits between the child and the social worker must take place in person. This change became effective at the beginning of the fiscal year, July 1. Should you have any questions related to this change, please reach out to us in the chat. You may also contact your regional child welfare specialist. Now we're going to cover the regulatory and licensing section of this webinar. We're going to start with the revised interstate services county assigned assignment list. The purpose of this interstate services ensures the safety, 
and well-being of children and youth who are placed across state lines to assist in the provision of these services. An ICPC consultant is assigned to each county. In January of this year, a DCDL or Deer County Director's Letter was sent out with an attached document for the revised county assignment list to show each ICPC consultant. Additional information in terms of our office has a new ICAMA consultant, which is an interstate compact of adoption and medical assistance um, consultant, which is designed to protect the interstate interests of children covered by the adoption assistance agreement when they move or are adopted across state lines. For more information, you can reach out to the Deputy Compact Administrator. We'll briefly consider the Adoption Assistance State Fund. Results from an internal audit revealed that counties are coding new vendor and cash assistant payments to this source. All counties must discontinue coding new adoption assistance cases to the state fund. If your county has any cases coded to this fund on the DSS 5095 form, which is also referred to the CPPS adoption assistance form, the respective director will receive an email that will identify these code cases and instructions on how to complete the required adjustment, considering that as of October 2011, this funding source is inactive. For additional information, you can reach out to the contacts related to Adoption Assistance State Fund. Let's move on and take a look at the responsible individual list requirements for prospective foster and adoptive parents. So back in 2014, all counties were notified of the requirement to print the results of the responsible's individual list for prospective foster parents and prospective adoptive parents. The division reissued this information in June of this year. The reason being, the division has been informed by our state auditor's office, it is insufficient for agencies to indicate on a submitted licensing form that the RIL check has been completed. Therefore, proof is needed. It is the county's responsibility to complete searches by the social security number and by name of each pers prospective applicant using the RIL register. Then you'll print out the results of each of these searches and retain the results in the adoptive applicant's file, regardless of whether there are any findings or not. For more information regarding these requirements, you can reach out to the consultant or coordinator or call the licensing and regulatory office located in Black Mountain. Now we're going to discuss the licensure requirement for respite. Appropriate placement can be a demanding task due to the lack of availability residential treatment placements for youth in foster care. With that being said, we want to highlight a few guidelines as you navigate alternative placement. For all children 
who are in custody as a child welfare agency, the child must be in a placement licensed by the state unless specifically approved by the court. This includes placement with unlicensed relatives. There has been some conflicting information about mental health rules and respite related to unlicensed um, providers. To clarify, community respite at a mental health facility is a service that provides periodic relief for a family or family substitute on a temporary basis. Temporary meaning a period of less than 24 hours. That may include overnight. A private home that provides more than 24 consecutive hours of respite care to a child in DSS custody is required to be licensed as a mental health facility in order to adhere to the general st statute 122C. This also applies to foster homes and facility-based respite providers. Now I'm going to hand it over to Nora to discuss Medicaid for foster children and youth. Thank you, Ms. Alicia. The DCDL related to Taylor case management came out last December, 2022. So about a year ago now. As I said, on December 1, 2022, children and youth in foster care who are eligible began receiving tailored care management. In addition to a webinar that has been made available, there are also reference guides for your youth. For any questions you may have for us, please type them in the chat. You may also reach out to the contact listed here directly. And earlier this year, you will see changes to North Carolina Medicaid transformation training for child welfare. North Carolina launched a North Carolina Medicaid Managed Care Behavioral Health and Intellectual Developmental Disabilities Tailored Plan on this past April 1, 2023, to support local departments of social services in understanding changes to come. This webinar focused on Medicaid transformation for youth and children in the foster care system, those that were receiving adoption assistance and those up to age 26. Here you will find the goals of the webinar, as well as the location as to where the webinar recording may be found. Again, please inform us of any questions you may have via chat or contact directly Medicaid North Carolina engagement. We thank you for um, putting your information in chat and we see this information. This includes our updated policy webinar content. However, please remain present as we have more important information to share with you. All right, and thank you to our presenters, Alicia and Nora and Lori in absentia for putting together all that wonderful information for you all. We hope that this is very helpful to each and every one of you. We do want to encourage you to please put your questions into the chat pod. We have folks who are diligently getting those all copied and they will be uh, answered and then put together in a document that will be sent out to everyone in that has registered for this webinar. 
Uh, so again, a holiday gift to each and every one of you and another holiday gift. See, we are just such givers here that has been put in the file pod right in front of y'all is the uh, policy updates webinar slides. Now, those of you who registered for today should have received a copy of these slides already. However, we know there are gremlins in the email system. So by all means, if you would like to download these files from the file pod here, you are welcome to do so. You should see it right above the nifty little purple questions uh, part of the slide. You'll say it says 2023 policy updates, webinar slides. Um, but again, if you have other questions with us, we want you to please uh, enter them into the chat pod so we can go ahead and get uh, those questions to you as well, uh, questions answered and those answers to you. You don't need the questions. You're providing them uh, to us as well. Uh, so as we move forward here again, please, please, please put your questions in here. We also want to make sure that um, if you want to connect to our uh, presenters, again, Lori and Absentia, who is a regional trainer for the division, you have Nora and you have Alicia and you have their emails here as well. Um, so you can download these slides. You can email our presenters. Uh, and let us know your thoughts. If you have any comments you need to let us know, by all means, uh, put into the chat pod and let us know what, we're, what you need from us in terms of other answers. 